The Cube presents UiPath Forward 5. Brought to you by UiPath. Hi everybody, welcome back to Las Vegas. You're watching theCUBE's coverage of UiPath Forward 5. We reach cruising altitude on day two. Christina Seacrest is here. She's the Process Artificial Intelligence and Automation GPS Automation Leader at EY. And Bob Pucci is Executive Director for Intelligent Automation for the State of Tennessee. Folks, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you for having us. Good to us. have you. Okay, I don't know if I messed up that title, Christina, but it's kind of interesting. You got process, you got AI, you got automation, <laughs> you got GPS. What's your role? I have a lot of roles, so thank you for that. Yes, yeah, so my focus is, first and foremost, automation. So how do you get things like UiPath into our clients? But also, I focus specifically in our government and public sector clients. So SLED specifically, so state, local education, so that's why I'm here with the state of Tennessee. And then we also like to take it beyond automation. So how do you bring in artificial intelligence and all the technologies that come with that? So really full end-to-end -end spectrum of automation. So Bob, when you think about the sort of the, the factors that are driving your organization, uh, how did you describe that, those sort of external factors that inform your strategy? What, what's, what are the catalysts for how you determine to deploy technology? Well, it's primarily that we, you know, Tennessee just has a tendency to provide good customer service, but we want to get to a great status, best in class, if you will. And we had an external advisory review where it said, hey, you know, we could um, make automation to improve our customer experience. And so that was like a directive of the, the state leaders to um, go across the board and automate all um, processes statewide, starting with the 23 executive agencies. So. Where's the focus from that standpoint? Is it uh, on just providing better interfaces to your constituents, your customers? Is it cutting costs so you actually have more budget to in invest? Kind of a combination of those? Yeah, so it's, it's really both qualitative and quantitative, mm -hmm. right? So quantitative is where we're able to reduce hours and therefore we can redirect people to more, um, less mundane work, if you will. And then qualitative is where we're able to reduce the errors, improve data quality, uh, reduce cycle time for our citizens you know, when they're making requests, et cetera. So it's, I think it's a combination of both of those uh, quantitative and qualitative metrics that we are m mandated in and micromanaged, quite frankly, to, uh, to bring, make those numbers. So I'm from Massachusetts. When I go to a, a, a mass.gov website, I say, all right, this was <coughs> done in the 1990s. And you can just see where the different stovepipes were, were. But then, Every now and then you'll hit one and you'll say, wow, okay, this is updated, it's such a great experience. And then the flip side of that is, you want your employees to be happy and not have to do all this mundane work so you can retain the best people. You don't have to, so you're living that in, in state and, and local. So where did you start your automation journey? What role did EY play? Let's get. Yeah, sure, so I, I think the thought for process automation was probably three or four years ago, um, but then um, we, started the program about 18 months ago. Um, and there was a lot of, let's say, behind the scenes work before we could bring EY in. Uh, you know, like what resources was I going to have in, uh, in the state that were going to help me address all of the uh, agencies simultaneously. Because right? normally you'll see a project that'll do, be more siloed across the state and say, we're going to do this agency, we're going to do this division. Well, you have 40 other agencies that are, you know, the momentum is it's just going to fall to the wayside. So how we looked at it was, let's blanket it and go across all 23 agencies at the same time. You know, identify common processes that are used across 40 divisions, for example, right? So, so what we basically did is we procured the software, you know, did the contracts, and then it was really about, I designed, a, I'm going to say a multi-stream approach where they were, we, we could run multiple work streams independent to find all the architectures required, dev, test, production, the disaster recovery. At the same time, in parallel, develop the center of excellence, the operation model, the processes, methodologies. And the third one was, let's go out to a few divisions, business administration, um, health, you know, um, health uh, human resources, and be able to do a process inventory to see what was there. And then based on that, there, there's all this theory of let's do a proof of concept, let's do a proof of technology, this will apply it. Well, the bottom line is RPA technology has been around for a long time. It's proven, there's nothing to prove. But really what was important to prove before we decided to go you know, full tilt was you know, develop a proof of perceived business value. 
are we going to bring in the, the business value, the hours, and the qualitative metrics that is expected by our ex executive team, the leadership? We were able to do that you know, with the help of, help of EY. We built out the prototypes, and we got the green light to go forward, got EY to start, and then we just basically went pedal to the metal. We had our foundation already defined. We built up the architecture in less than one to two months. Now, in, in a public sector or private sector, it's just not heard of, right? But we have a tendency with EY's technical team and myself, we look around the, the road around the rock instead of the rock in the road, right? So we ended up coming up with a very unique, very easy to, easy to handle architecture um, that was very scalable, and then we're able to hit the ground running and deploy in production by December, we're head off. Was EY involved in the whole, you know, dev test production DR, center of excellence, the the process inventory, or did you bring them in? Did you kind of do that internally and then bring EY in for the yeah, proof e of business EY, value? Um, EY was actually um, awarded the contract for soup to nuts, basically the first phase, which was those four work right, streams okay. I told you about. Mm -hmm. And um, they worked with myself and the state of Tennessee infrastructure architecture teams. Um, we needed to get these things defined and signed off the architecture so we could expedite getting them uh, built out. Um, and then they and they basically ran all four work streams, you know, the process inventory, the prototype, the, the um, proof of um, perceived business value, the building out the center of excellence, working with myself, and um, and this wasn't just us in a, a vacuum. We ended up having new. I mean, I could do the strategy, I could do the technology, and I could do the roadmap and all the good stuff, but we had to actually meet with a lot of the state of tenancy organizations on change management. How do we end up putting this process, or a, a, an automation in the middle of the, the normal traditional process, right? Um, so there was a lot of interaction there and getting their feedback and then tweaking our operational model based on feedback from the state of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. um, so it was all very collective, collaborative. Uh, I think that would be the key word is collaborative. Um, and then building out everything. So then, and then we ended up going to the next way where we, they knew so much, and we were we had such a tight time frame that we continued with EY. So Christina, Bob mentioned center of excellence a couple of times. Um, in the state of Tennessee, but then beyond state of Tennessee, other organizations you've worked with in this space. What's the relationship between center of excellence and this thing we've been hearing about over the last couple of days, the citizen developer? Um, has that, been, has, has, has that been leveraged in the state of Tennessee, Bob? Uh, have you seen that leveraged in other places, Christina? What's that relationship look like? Yeah, so we don't leverage that, that model yet. We have a centralized model and there's reasons for that, so we don't end up having Mavericks run off, you know, run off, have one offs, like have, you know, have a, a UiPath version or down this division or have another RPA tool in another div div division, right? So then all of a sudden we're, we have a maintenance nightmare, manageability nightmare. So we basically, you know, I, I, I negotiated an ELA with UiPath. So therefore, if anyone wants to go do another automation on another division, or they would basically follow our model, our design, our COE, our quality gates. We, we're the gatekeepers to bring it into production. Mm -hmm. Got it. Now, right. Yeah, now Christina, what's your perspective? Because I can imagine Nashville and Memphis might have very different ideas about a lot of things. Yeah. Little Tennessee reference there. But what, 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 about, <laughs> what, what about other places? Are you, are you seeing the citizen developer leveraged in, in some kinds of places more than not, others? Not or what? yet, and that's partly because of the foundation we're building. So yeah. we laid, you know, when Bob talks about the first phase of eight weeks, that was amazingly fast. Even when you spoke about yeah. it, to say you're going to lay these four foundations, I was excited. Like I was like, "Wow, this, yeah. this this is a very serious client. They want to go fast and they want to get that momentum." But the AOM was laid out so we could propel ourselves. So we are at 40 automations right now. We're in the works of creating 80 more automations in this next year. We'll be at 120 really quickly. The AOM is critical, and I will say, at a client, I've you know, I've worked with over 50 clients on automation programs. The way State of Tennessee treats the AOM and they abide by it, it is the living document of how you go and go fast. Got it. And the one thing I would say is it's also allowed us to have such immense quality. So I always talk about, you put in 40, you put in another 80, we're at 98% uptime on all our automations, meaning they don't go down. And that's because of the AOM we set up. And the natural progression is going to be, how do you take it to citizen developer? How do you take it to, we call it, you know, process automation plus. But methodically, else. methodically. It's not methodically. just throwing it out at the beginning and, and hoping the chaos uh, works. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And the ratio of, 
of bots to automations? Is that one to one, or you have automations? Oh no, a single bot is doing multiple. So how many bots are you talking? We're about? doing. Bob, you're going to answer this better than I will. But the efficiency is amazing. Okay. We've been pushing that. Um, so our ratio now, because we have a high density architecture, we put in is um, four bots. No, excuse me, four processes to one bot, and four bots to one um, virtual machine, EC2 server. Right. So it's four to one, four to one. Now, what we're going to get by next summer, we'll do more analysis, we'll probably get to six to one, six to one. That's made serious shrinkage of our footprint from a machine you know, um, management perspective, from 60 down to seven, yeah. right? Now we're going to, the next chunk, we add another 80 um, automations in fiscal year 24. We're only going to add two more bots, two more servers, right? So that's only 10, running off, like close to 200 bots. And, and is doing this on prem in the cloud? No, our, our, the architecture is fully All cloud, cloud based. Fully cloud, EC2, right? yeah. So we use UiPath SaaS model. Yeah. Right? So that handles the orchestrator, the attended bots, all the other tooling you need, automation hub, process miner, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then on the state side in AWS, we have uh, we use unattended bots. Certain bots that have to go down into the legacy systems, et cetera, and they're sitting on EC2 instances. Was there was there a security knothole that you had to get through internally? What was that like? No, actually, we 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 were lock in step with the security team mm -hmm. on this. I mean, there were some standards and templates and you know what we had to follow. You know, but they're doing an assessment every single release. They do assessments on all the bots, what systems it's activating or, or accessing, etc. The data because you have FedRAMP data, you have FTI data. You know, in the public sector, we had to make sure we're not touching that. Do you guys golf? I do. Yeah. Not well, if but yes. You, yeah, I mean, I, I like golf, but not don't golf well. <laughs> but so you know what a mulligan is. If you had a mulligan, right, for the state of Tennessee, what'd you learn? What would you do differently? You know, what are some of the gotchas you see, maybe Christina, in, in other customers, um, and then maybe specifically state of Tennessee? Right. I would say you know, it is the intangibles. So mm -hmm. when we talk about our clients that go fast and go big, like state of Tennessee. It's because that, that we call it phase zero that gets done, that Bob did. It's about making sure you've got the sponsorship. So we've got executive sponsorship all the way up. You've got amazing stakeholder engagement. So you're communicating the values of what we're trying to do. And you're, you're showing them the value. We have been really focused on the return on investment. And we'll talk a little bit about that, but it's how do you make sure that when you do, you know, states are different with those agencies. You have such an opportunity to maximize return on investment if you do it right, because you're not talking about automation in one agency, you're talking it across multiple agencies. Mm -hmm. We call that the multiplier effect, and that's huge. And if you understand that and how to actually apply that, the value you get is amazing. So, I, I, don't, I can't say there's a mulligan here, and Bob, you may think of some. I know on other clients, if you don't line up your stakeholders and you don't set the expectations early on, you meander, and you may get five, six automations in over the year, you know, when I go to clients and say, we're doing 40, we're doing 80, they're like, wow. That's the, but that's the bottom line, gotcha, is if you, if you want to have an operational impact and have multiple zeros, you got to go through that process that you said up front. Exactly. A anything you do differently, Bob? <coughs> well, I, I, what I do differently, uh, I mean, I think, I mean, we, we did get executive sponsorship, you know, in, in one area, but we still have to go out to all the 23 agencies and get, and bring awareness and kind of like set the hook to bring them in, right? Bring them to the, to the, to the lake, right? And, and I think um, if, if it was more of a blanket, top down, getting every agency to agree to, you know, in, investigate automation, it would have been a lot easier. So we're, we're, we're getting it done. We've gone through 13 agencies already in less than a year. All of our releases are sprinkling across multiple agencies. So it's not like a silo, I'll look at that age. Everyone, every agency is being impacted. So I think that's great. Um, but I, I think our, our mulligan now is just trying to make sure that we have enough backlog to do the next sprints. You know, yes. Is it, you know, this, the ROI on these uh, initiatives is, is, is so clear and so fast. Is it self-funding? Is there gain sharing? Or do you just give business, give money back to the state and have to scramble for more? Do you get the, you know, get a lick off that cone? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, we don't. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I tried to see if we could get some property. Like, now nah, we don't do that. It's all cost-based. Cost but, um, but our ROI is very attractive, I think, for, um, for doing a whole state, you know, uh, uh, transformation. Um, I think our ROI is three and a half to four years. Right? And that's pretty mind-blowing. Even if you look at private sector, or, uh, I, I think some of the, the key things which 
people are noticing, even though we're in public sector, we are we are very nimble. This project is extremely nimble. We've had people come in exactly. We need this, or we're going to get penalized. Okay, they knock it out in four hours, four days, right? So. It's that nimbleness that you just don't hear of even in private sector or public sector. And we're just able to do that for all the collaboration we do across EY, across myself, and across all the other organizations that I, that I kind of drag along or what have you. So. What do you, what do, you do you see any limits to the opportunities here? I mean, is this a decade-long opportunity? Is, do you have that much runway? Well, that's just not in my DNA. So we're going we're <laughs> to probably do it like in four years. Um, but what, well, when you say do it, I mean, what, 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 will what, you be done at that point, or do I, you see the opportunity so the way, the to way really look drive at it is, for, you know, we could boil the ocean, and I think this is one of the reasons why we're successful. Is um, we could boil the ocean and, and be it would be a ten to twenty year program. Yeah, okay. Or we looked at it. We had some of EY guys look at it and say, I said, what's the twenty five eighty rule? Meaning, you know, give me. So we had five hundred processes. Tell me how many processes will give me 80% of the hours. Mm -hmm. And it was 125. It was a 25 80 rule. I said, that's what we're doing. Now. We're doing, we're, we're going to do the 80% of the hours quantifiably. Now, when we're done with that pass, then we'll have those other ones that are bringing 20% of the hours. That's when we might be bringing citizens in. Mm -hmm. That's what we're bringing state workers in. But at that same time, we will be going back in the wave and doing advanced AI, right. or advanced. Um, I yeah. in, in other words, so right now we do RPA, OCR, ICR, but you know there's N NL, NL, NPS, there's vir virtual agents and stuff. So that's like the way we're gonna do through the ones we've already gone through. Got it. Right. So it'll probably be a two or three wave or iterations. Cool, guys. Thanks so much for coming to the cube. Great story. Really appreciate you taking us through it. Thank you Thank so you. much for having Thank us. You. You're very welcome. All right, keep it right there, Dave Nicholson and Dave Vellante. We're back at UI Path Forward Five from the Venetian in Las Vegas. Keep it right there.